Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Uh, thank you so much for joining me for another episode. Uh, today is going to be a really good one. Uh, this is one I've been thinking about for a while now, and now that I've been practicing and, and learning to edit videos more often, uh, this is going to be a, a really excitable video for me. And uh, so I made a few videos. Uh, there's been some copyright stuff. So like, for example, uh, Ninja Turtles out of my animated my favorite animated theme songs video was had to be deleted because of that. And uh, I've made a couple other videos uh, since then. I'm hoping once I post them, I haven't posted them as of this filming. I'm hoping that they, uh, they go through with no issues and I don't have to cut any scenes out or anything like that. Now, because I'm going to have to incorporate a lot of movie scenes into this particular video, I'm really hoping that this isn't strike, uh, does not strike against this video either. But, I guess we won't know until we actually post the video and find out. So, uh, I've said it before, years ago, you know, my wife and I were sitting down, we're watching Saw, and you've got people getting cut in half and everything, and I'm just sitting there eating my ice cream or whatever. Yep. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Absolutely no reaction uh, to the horror that's right in front of you. Most people are going to be really squeamish. They're going to uh, you know, be covering their eyes, they're going to be grossed out. To me, it's like, you know, any other day. Uh, you see it every day. Uh, I think nothing about it. And it, and she says that I am very desensitized. Especially when it comes to, like, horror movies and, you know, being around brutal murders and all that. She says I'm very desensitized. And it got, it got me thinking. And, you know, I've, I've said it plenty. My household is was not the typical household that most families were raised in, where you put your 18-month-old child, your 2-year-old, your 3-year-old, your 4-year-old, etc., in front of the TV, and they're watching Sesame Street. You know, they're learning how to count, learning how to read, stuff like that. You weren't watching Barney or Arthur or any of these little kiddie shows. No. In my house, I don't care if we were a day old. 10 years old, 100 years old, we were, <laughs> we were exposed to the most hardcore murder scenes and brutality, and you know what, it was something you never thought twice about, because just, just what we were raised in, so, uh, I, I chose five movie scenes that I feel like helped in my desensitation, desensitivity uh, towards movie scenes or, or whatnot. So, am I desensitized? I don't know. I mean, do I get uh, grossed out every now and then? I mean, if I watch Faces of Death and I'm watching the dogs get cut into, which I found out later that that's actual toys, that's not actual dogs, which I don't buy it, but... Yeah, that right there is going to gross me out. Shoot. You know, little puppies. Shoot. Uh, damn. Th that's a movie that could have been on this list. <laughs> but uh, this is the five uh, movie scenes that I think are pretty fantastic. Uh, they highlight the brutality of some of these some of these genre of the genre of horror and these particular serial killers. Now, the first movie I wanted to talk about, it's not going to be part of this uh, video, unfortunately. But, I, I originally, Howling 3, The Marsupials. So, what was it about The Marsupials that was so integral to my childhood? You know, for years, I had absolutely no idea what that movie was. I just remember, so Marsupials came out in 87, so I don't think I'm two years old. I think I'm probably like three or four years old or something. And I talked about, you know, growing up in this apartment on uh, Francisco, uh, the street named Francisco, uh, back in Chicago, up until I was about age four, age five. And uh, I remember coming out of the bedroom. It was it was dark in there, so it had to be nighttime, obviously. And I remember walking into the living room, and I just saw on the TV this bald guy strapped to a chair getting electrocuted. And later on, he would transform into a werewolf. For the longest time, I had no idea what that movie was or how to find it. I don't know if I found out 
what that movie was three years ago, ten years ago. I, I, I don't remember, to be honest. If I had to guess, when I first got to Fort Hood in December 2004, up until I moved off, uh, moved off post in uh, June 2005, uh, I lived on base. And uh, the, the barracks that we stayed in, they were like these really beautiful apartments. They were probably like maybe a 10 minute walk or so away from uh, the airfield PX. And the, the PX out there, they had all of these, they had movies, and electronics. So every weekend, I'd walk over to the PX and buy a movie or two, you know, something to keep me busy because even then, I'm just the same way I am now. I'm a, you know, house rat. I don't like going out. I don't know if it's being uncomfortable in public. I don't, I don't know, but I always got, try got a movie that, you know, interests me. And I found The Howling 3. So I'm thinking that's probably when uh, I learned about that movie. Now, at either watching the movie itself or at some point learning about that movie, but I think it was actually watching the movie that that scene popped up. I'm like, Psh, unbelievable. I've been searching for this movie for years, probably a decade and a half or more, and here it is. So... Unfortunately, I couldn't find that direct scene anywhere, so I decided to go with an alternate. We are sticking with the werewolf genre, and this is probably the most traumatic scene in cinematic history. You, real, you really feel every ounce of pain that this character is suffering. Uh, he does an absolutely amazing job with this particular transformation. So here is my number five pick. Jesus Christ! Blood! God! Fire! Oh! Oh! I'm burning up! Oh! 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 So, coming in at number five, David Naughton from An American Werewolf in London. To me, one of three of the greatest werewolf movies in history. You could choose, man. You, you can have Dog Soldiers, which I personally select nowadays. Uh, I follow it up with An American Werewolf in London and then follow it up by uh, the first Howling movie. You could really put them in any order, but I think any one of them could easily be number one, number two, number three, etc. So, 
like I said, the pro the greatest transformation scene ever. I, I mean, I don't care what it is. You, you could be transferring into a were coyote or, or something. Any, basically any of the wares. <laughs> but whether you're transforming into a werewolf or, you know, some kind of other creature or monster, best transformation scene. And the horror and the fear that comes out of that movie, amazing. Uh, coming in at number four. Now, here is a movie that came out in 1985. I still think that the original, you know, the first movie was the best, but part two still keeps in in line with this with this horror franchise. And I, I think because growing up, I you know, we had that movie on VHS, and it was one of those movies that we watched all the time. And for the longest time, I hated the movie. Not really hated it, but because, again, it was something we watched all the time. I just didn't have the sort of appreciation for Part 2 that I had for other movies. But, like I said, it was still very horror and very, you know, obviously very horror-related. Whereas, later movies become more com uh, more comedic in reference to this particular character. So, I tried to show the one scene from this movie that really show the depths of horror and fear uh, of the particular character and for this movie franchise. So uh, this is the scene I selected for number four. So, Freddy Krueger from A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. It came out in 85. Again, I wasn't watching it from birth. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure I was watching that movie from a very early age. Four, five, six years old. Probably into the mid-90s. You know, I don't I don't remember actually owning any other Freddy Krueger, uh, Freddy Krueger movie on VHS. Now, obviously, when I got into later teens, and I started buying all my own DVDs and whatnot. Um, yeah, once I got my job, when I was when I turned 16, I was able to pay for, for my own mo movies. Uh, yeah, I started buying up a lot of DVDs because around 2000, between 99 and 2001 is when DVDs first, you know, really hit the shelves and really became big. So, I, I ended up having all of my, you know, tape from HBO or tape from Showtime, you know, uh, blank tapes. Then I had store-bought VHSs and the DVDs. You know, I had them all kind of mixed in together. And kind of funny because today, if I if I had seen that, like if my collection were looking just like that, that would absolutely kill me. Uh, I like everything to be dressed right, dressed and everything, and and seeing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I'm like, nope. If I have one DVD of this, I need all of them on DVD. If I have one VHS, I need them all on VHS. You got one DVD, one VHS? Guess what? You're getting all the movies for each <laughs> for each format. But Freddy Krueger, such a freaking legend. What was it, eight movies? Uh, or is it nine? I, I can't remember if uh, the 2010 remake was part eight or nine. And then you gotta throw in Freddy vs. Jason, so... You, you kind of add on an extra movie to both those franchises. <laughs> so one of the scenes I kind of thought about was a scene where Freddy basically ch cuts his head down the middle and slices open. Uh, or the part where he slices open um, the lead character. Uh, what the heck was his name? Um, 
uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but and Freddy comes out of his body insane. There are some a lot of really tremendous scenes that came out of part two. Like I said, part one is still the best ever, no doubt, but it this this was a movie and these are some scenes that basically changed my life, I think. So uh we are now moving on to part or to my third most memorable horror movie moment that desensitized me. Here it is. Shall we begin? So, coming at number three from uh, 1992, Hellraiser 3. I'm pretty sure I saw the first two Hell Ra Hellraiser movies at some point in my life uh, prior to ever seeing Hellraiser 3. But for whatever reason, to me, Hellraiser 3 is the oldest movie that I can remember. Now, going back, you know, later on and, you know, watching part one, I've seen part one countless times part two several times over the course of my life but again part uh part three was the one i i remember most maybe because i was older and could actually comprehend it a lot more i still think the first three Hell hellraiser movies were absolutely unbelievable three of the best movies of a franchise of any franchise and then once you get into like part four, they, they jump the shark and they go to outer space. Because everybody has to go to outer space. Jason's gotta go to space. Leprechaun's gotta go to space. They gotta put a they gotta put Pinhead in space. What the ever loving. So I didn't care for part four. Was it a good movie? Sure, but part five through eight were were basically the exact same movie. You know, person is in, you kind of eventually learn that the person is actually in hell and that what they were experiencing up to, you know, trying to solve this mystery had really no bearing on their, what happened at the end because they were already dead and rotting in hell essentially. So part five through eight were all the exact same type of movie. That was kind of stupid. I didn't like that. Uh, there was a movie I saw, I think in 2017, uh, they came out with a new one and 80 minute movie. I was really disappointed. Uh, 2022, they actually came out with a female led Hellraiser movie. I gotta be honest, uh, a two hour movie and for Hellraiser, I don't mind watching a two hour movie for Hellraiser. I made it through about an hour and a half and I was just so freaking bored. I don't even remember even seeing the female uh, lead as Pinhead. I don't know if it's because it's... No, I can't even say that. But like I said, Pinhead, uh, as the female, she was, she didn't even show up, I don't think, or, or had very limited uh, FaceTime in the first hour and a half. So, 
I, I really can't. I can't blame you know the change of character. I, I think in the movie prior, back in like 2017, they didn't have the same actor. They had a different uh, guy portraying uh, Pinhead. It was still an adequate movie. I mean, it wasn't bad. Uh, so, with this particular movie, Hellraiser 3, this bar scene or club scene where Pinhead just shows up and all hell breaks loose... I mean, it's like shouting fire or having a, a building go up in flames and you're locked in. Everybody's falling all over the place. These guys are being brutalized with flying chains coming out of nowhere. I like the the guy with the discs. Got the, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I mean, some guy was brutally murdered with a bunch of DVDs, but... I mean, it's just the material used... To complete the, the the kill scene, I'm like, wow. So, Hellraiser, you could really choose any scene from any movie, but I I, I like that. It, to me, uh, it just had the most bulk, memorable moments. So, God, I think I am desensitized. I mean, shoot, I'm laughing about a bunch of. It's not real. Keep that in mind when you watch this video. What I am talking about is make-believe, okay? It'd be a completely different story if this actually happened to someone in real life. So, you're not having an actual serial killer go around murder people in a club or not, so... Uh, calm down, guys. Don't mind me. Uh, part number two. <laughs> what is my second most... Memorable TV moment. So coming at number two, of course you're going to have Jason on this list. How do you have horror icons and not list Jason freaking Voorhees, man? So many killer moments from Jason, but I think watching him squash a guy's head so much that his freaking eyes pop out, that's got to be a game changer. That was an unbelievable moment. And it's like, it sucks because it's like your friend is that close to you and your face is, is covered. You can't scream for help. You know how frustrating that is. Or imagine, you know, you're someone who's been kidnapped and the police are like steps away, but you're gagged and, and you can't, or you, and you're tied down, you can't move and you call, can't call for help. And knowing that help is that close to you and, I mean, really, was she going to be do anything to help her boyfriend in this, in this, in this clip? No, but you, you would hope that it would have made a somewhat of a difference. And... What a brutal way to die. I'm sorry, but to me, there are certain things I don't want. I don't want to drown because I kind of feel like just the inability to to get to catch your breath, right? I mean, that is such a, a scary and horrific way to die. Being burned alive has kind of like the very same effect. At least you kind of think about being burned alive. Maybe the smoke inhalation knocks you out before, you know, before you get burned to death. But I would, I don't want to, I don't want to drown. I don't want to be burned, burned alive. Um, I don't want to be eaten alive. Could you imagine being thrown into a pit with a bunch of zombies or werewolves? Or heck, man, just rabid dogs or or pigs, you know, that haven't eaten in weeks or something. Crazy. I mean, I don't want to be Hannibal lecter and thrown into a pig pen and eaten alive. Wow. 
Uh, yeah, being crushed to death. You know, like, like you get into those little trash compactors and they close in and suddenly you're literally a pancake and it's like horrible, horrible way to die. And this scene, to me, as, as a fan of horror and enjoying the unique kill scenes, I think that's why Jigsaw and Saw is so amazing. There's such unique uh, different takes on how to, to, uh, to assassinate someone, but... Ugh, that gets me every time. So, what is my most memorable TV moment or movie moment that I feel desensitized me? Here it is. Watch it. Safely say that Michael Myers is now in your hands. Yeah, well, I guess you're happy to see him go. Locked and loaded. Now let's roll. Tight knock. Ride carefully. say anything about living relatives? Yeah, a niece living in his hometown. And? And she's too young to be his legal ward. So the state owns him? Great. No, I still don't understand. <laughs> So, coming in at number one is 1987, I believe, or if it was 88. I want to say 1987's Halloween 4. And, uh... Oh, man, this friggin' movie. So, my my niece, she's probably a few years younger than I am. Uh, so, she had to be born somewhere between 1980, 1990. But... When we were when we were young, my oldest brother he used to always put on that movie for her. It was her for, her favorite movie, and to say that we watched that movie every day, we pretty much did watch that movie every day. So I've probably seen Halloween four a hundred million times in my life. Halloween four, easily, at least in my opinion, the greatest Halloween movie ever. Halloween five was such so lackluster. Six got a little bit better. Seven was bad. Eight was horrible. And the remakes obviously make up for it a little bit, but uh, there's no... And I don't really remember Halloween 3, so... I mean, it wasn't Michael Myers inspired, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, among among the Michael Myers movies, Halloween 4, hands down. No-brainer. And this particular scene always stands out to me of all the different kill scenes. You know, normally he'll just stab someone through the chest and, you know, stab them so hard that the knife goes through their back and now they're pinned to the door or something. But to to stick your thumb, okay, to have the physical strength to literally stick your finger through someone's head past their skull, how? How is someone capable of that type of strength? I could not imagine. I talk about being eaten alive or crushed alive as being a horrible way to die. I mean, ugh. Taking your face. How is that? I am blown away by superpowers of, of Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees. They are... I mean, how else would you describe them? They are supernatural beings, sure, but they essentially got their own version of superpowers. Uh, they can't be killed, which that right there kind of, you know, kills it. 
do you want your your horror villains to be killed? No, you want them to live on so that you can have more sequels. But yeah, there's one thing about surviving a gunshot, but there's something completely different when <laughs> when they unload shotgun blast after shotgun blast on you and you survive. I mean that just then it just kind of becomes stupid and redundant. But I am a horror fan. I love all of these horror icons. So Leatherface and Pinhead and Ghostface, you know, Freddy, Jason, Michael, Child's Play. You know, Pumpkinhead has a ton of really fantastic movies. So these are all icons and um uh, how, I mean, I, I guess because I've watched, literally been bred from from the beginning to enjoy horror or to be involved in horror, to to openly watch horror, you know, it didn't mess me up in the head to the point where I'm terrified of watching horror movies later on in into adulthood. No, I'm still horror obsessed. Uh, I can always depend on a, a good horror movie, even if it's low budget. <laughs> You don't get that with comedy or dramas and all that. So, yeah, I will always cater towards the horror genre as much as possible. So, did they help me or did they hurt me in the long run mentally because I'm desensitized by these by these uh, movies and uh, didn't really have the opportunity, I would say, to kind of grow up in... In a safe, I would say. Because you think about Sesame Street. I, I, it's a perfect example because it's been around for like five or six decades. Uh, you're kind of like in a safe environment, you know. It, it's a very child-oriented TV show. And it's to, to teach kids how to how to read and, and, and you know, know how to count and things like that. I never watched Sesame Street. Um... There was a uh, an episode with the Wicked Witch from the original Wizard of Oz movie that my wife downloaded because it, it came up as a banned Sesame Street episode. And my wife and I, we sat down, we watched that, and oh my god, I would have shot myself in the head if I was a child watch, having to grow up and watch that. It wasn't, I mean, they made it seem like it was so darn scary. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is a joke. How? What is scary about this at all? But that's that's me. That's the environment I grew up in. So, all right, guys, uh, that is my list of five memorable moments, memorable scenes. So, uh, please tell me what yours are, because let's be honest, we all enjoy horror, or have seen horror, or have something that has given us nightmares, or uh, something that we wish we could take back <laughs> and never see. Do I got anything else right now? I don't think so. Uh, that's pretty much it. So, again, I'm really hoping that this video, that it, there's no strikes and that there's no copyright. I can, right now, I have to, uh, I had to download the videos, the, the movie clips separately, and I had to download the audio separately. So now I got to kind of sync up the audio with the, with the video, and hopefully I don't mess that up because it, it's just easier just to do it the one way, but... I, I've been noticing a lot of the things I've been uh, loading up late, lately. Uh, there's been no volume to it. So if any of the scenes are cut, you will know that, you know, YouTube uh, required that those cut scenes. But uh, uh, hopefully everything will go through smoothly with no issues. All right, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, goodbye, everybody.